a science story, huh? These NYU scientists, they felt felt right. I was so And I just thought, well, I had figured it out. It was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, welcome to The Story Clatter, where true personal stories about science help us to discover how weird and wonderful it is to exist in this world and be a human. I'm your host, Misha Gajewski, and today our stories are about genetic mysteries and the secrets that lie within DNA. If you've ever wanted Story Clatter to be more like a true crime podcast, then this episode is definitely for you. Kicking it off, our first storyteller is Mackenzie Brown. Mackenzie Brown is a clinical and social researcher currently working as a project manager at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Her story was shared at Caveat in New York for a special show we did for Brain Week in partnership with Mount Sinai's Friedman Brain Institute. No spoilers, but her story is devastating, but like in the best way possible, and I'm so excited I get to share it with you today. Here's Mackenzie. My dad passed away from sudden cardiac arrest when I was six years old. Ever since then, I've had an intense fear of heart-related issues. This is partly unfounded, though, because I'm adopted. So while I won't inherit my dad's poor heart genes, I don't actually know what genes I did inherit. My brother is also adopted, and both of our adoptions were closed, but it was never kept a secret from us that we were adopted. Looking back on the way that we were raised, my family always made it a point to tell us that families were created all different ways. Some are made, some are found, and some are chosen. Our family just happened to be made all three of those ways, and that's called adoption. I always knew that I wanted to find my biological mom one day. I really wanted to learn more about my family history, and I always struggled with the nature versus nurture question. What parts of me could be attributed to biology, and what parts of me were influenced by my environment? My bad sense of humor and my dry sense of humor had to come from somewhere, and I needed to know who to blame for my pathological existentialism. It was becoming a problem. My brother's biological mom found him during the pandemic. Texting back and forth turned into phone and video calls, which progressed to him posing with them on family vacation to the lake for their Christmas card. He had six new brothers and sisters to discuss the latest Star Wars theories with, and I was jealous. Not because I loved Star Wars, but because I wanted siblings. I'm the OS, the original sister, like I like to call it, but that's really tough competition. His nature and nurture were coming together so beautifully to paint this picture of his past and help narrate his present. But where was mine, right? I was so happy for him, but didn't I deserve that too? I had theories that I wanted to discuss. Granted, they were more informed by my passion for mental health research and the psychological implications of the Stanford prison experiment, but still, (laughs) where was mine? I struggled with these questions quite a bit on and off. And I wasn't ready to start trying to find answers to these questions until after I had graduated from my master's of public health program, which is where I fully started to understand the importance that social support had on my overall health and happiness. So naturally, I put on my white lab coat, like a real scientist, and I collected my spit in a tiny little test tube, and I sent it off to Ancestry.com to be analyzed. I was convinced that my biological mom or another close relative would pop up in the search results. According to my DNA, though, my closest living relative was a third cousin who lived all the way in Scotland with no connections to this half of the world. 
this was effectively a dead end. Should I spend more money on another DNA service like 23andMe? Should I hire a private investigator? Did people even do that outside of the movies and TV shows? I had no idea. As a young adult, WebMD had become my best friend. A general sense of worry about nothing in particular, as it goes when you have anxiety, had always simmered on the surface for me, but strange new symptoms like heart palpitations and air hunger, which is a thing, um, <laughs> brought that simmer to a boil with an overwhelming sense of panic and impending doom about all of the ways that I could actively be dying at any given moment. Being supportive, my boyfriend at the time suggested that starting my search again for answers to these questions about my family history and specifically my family health history could help ease some of these worries. So a couple months later, when we were sitting at a brewery on the patio drinking a nice cold Kolsch on a beautiful spring day, we brought the conversation up again. I didn't know where to begin the search, and he suggested that I search for her on Facebook. People were reunited on Facebook all the time, right? It sounded a little too simple, and why hadn't I thought of that? But I eagerly picked up my phone and felt my heart start to race and beats hammer in my chest and the beats reverberating throughout my body as I picked up my phone and opened the Facebook app. With shaky and trembling hands, I typed in my mom's name on Facebook and saw a bunch of profiles pop up. I sighed a little with relief. More options meant this had a bigger chance this was going to work. My eyes scanned the first two profiles on the left, taking in the names and the vague locations of the individuals. I had known my mom's name, and it was pretty unique, so that helped. But I knew almost immediately that these weren't her. My mom had me when she was 19, and these individuals looked to be a little bit older than I expected my mom to look at this point in time. My anxiety peaked. Hot acid spread throughout my stomach like a battery had exploded. I realized not everybody had Facebook. Not even some of my close friends were on social media nowadays. What if this didn't work? What was my next step? My finger flipped the screen and the third thumbnail peeked over the horizon of the phone and I froze. I saw her long, oval face, upturned button nose, and freckles dotting her cheeks, hair the color of dandelion honey and steeped black tea. She was beautiful, and I looked like her. I eagerly pressed her profile so I could look at a bigger picture, see her clear, find the rest of myself within her profile. But it was loading so slowly. And while I waited, I contemplated what I would say in my first message to her. Hi, how are you? I'm your daughter. What do you say in a situation like that? I Googled it. <laughs> Nobody had any answers. <laughs> Finally, the page loaded in a blink and a flash of color, pixel by pixel, and I saw her face clear as day. I saw her infectious smile and could almost hear her contagious laughter through the screen. I scanned the rest of the page, looking for more of myself in the confines of her profile. But as I was looking, cursive letter caught my eye. And at the top of the page in the heading next to her name was in loving memory.
didn't that ending just hit you like a ton of bricks? When I first heard Mackenzie's story, I literally screamed, no, into my empty room. Anyway, to learn more about Mackenzie, visit our website, storyclutter.org. Being a storyteller on stage is just one way to make story clutter happen, but if standing alone in the spotlight in front of an audience doesn't speak to you, maybe becoming a story clutter donor might be more your speed. Story Collider donors play a vital role in our ability to bring you this podcast. We're in this together. Story Collider is one big experiment that's designed to connect us around our love of discovery, curiosity, and the natural world. If you believe in the power these stories have and this mission, please donate to the Story Collider at storyclutter.org slash donate. Most popular level is $10 a month, and you can make your tax-deductible donation at storyclutter.org slash donate. But really, any level makes a difference, and we're so grateful to everyone who supports Story Collider. What's the best way to learn a new language? Immersion. But sometimes that's not in the cards. But you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Now, I might only be one week into learning German with Babbel, but I'm so excited to start being able to speak German with my mom. With Babbel, you can learn everything you need to have real-world conversations, and all it takes is just 10 minutes a day. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college, which is bonkers. But Babbel is conversation-based learning with science-backed cognitive tools like spaced repetition and interactive lessons created by real language teachers and voiced by real native speakers. So here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash story. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash story, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash story. Rules and restrictions may apply. Our next story is from Martha Bricekind. Martha is an associate professor at North Carolina State University, and her story was recorded at NCSU in April for a special show we did with the NCSU's Genetics and Genomics Academy. Now, I'm not saying Martha's story could be an entire Netflix series, but it also totally could. That's how incredible it is. Martha's story truly had me reeling from start to finish. I didn't know what to expect, and I loved every minute of it. And I just know you will, too. Here's Martha. So, when I went away to school... I went to a small liberal arts college outside of New York City that was as far away from the San Francisco Bay Area where I grew up as I could get. And when I say it was a small liberal arts college, it was tiny. There was only a thousand, just a little over a thousand students. I was a theater major and I quickly fell into a really cool crowd of friends. We would stay up late. We were not smoking dope, but maybe some cigarettes and doing improv jams. Later, I would walk home in the cold New York night, get into my room, grab the phone from the middle of the room and drag it as close as I could to my bed, pull the coiled cord of the receiver up to my face, pull the covers over my head and call my mom and cry and cry and cry. I was wicked homesick. And this went on for months. And, you know, initially my mom was very sympathetic and definitely, you know, oh, I'm so sorry, sweetie, things like that. And then eventually she started talking about things about going on at work or going on in her life. And I kept thinking, what is wrong with her? Why doesn't she miss me as much as I miss her? This went on for some time, but eventually I started to feel a little less homesick, and I wasn't calling home quite as much. I had finally landed a role in a play. It was being produced by an off-Broadway director. It was very exciting. So things were looking up. And it was the Friday night before... um, I'm going to back up. (laughs) So I want to explain a little bit more about this homesickness thing and my mom. And so from when I was 12 until I went away to school, it was just the two of us. My dad had left, um, my brother and sister were away at college, and kind of secretly, it's what I had wanted. My mom and I were a lot alike. We were really close. Um, We just kind of drifted well together. Um, She was also, I was the baby, last of three, You know, she was single mom, working, 
and she was tired. And that meant I kind of had a lot of free reign. I came and went as I wanted to, as long as I was safe, and I checked in. It was totally cool. My brother and sister liked to tell me I had a totally different parent than they had. And so I had a lot of freedom, and she kind of, she kind of embraced and celebrated that freedom. But she was also kind of a badass. My mom had been a political activist since I could remember. She and a bunch of mothers started a school in East Palo Alto. They called themselves the Mothers for Equal Education. And then on a whim in her 40s, she decided to go to law school. And she became a criminal defense attorney. And she took cases that everybody thought were hopeless. She specialized in juvenile offenders. She even, she even represented a pot farmer, um, yep. Yeah, and that earned me all kinds of credit with my friends that, yeah, your mom is a badass. So on the one hand, it made sense that I missed her because we had this close relationship and I looked up to her. But on the other hand, given how independent I'd been, I came and went as I wanted to, it didn't make sense. So now we can fast forward to the, this part where I'm talking about not being quite as homesick and landing the play. And so it was the Friday night before the opening night of the, the play, and we were exhausted. We'd been working. It was dress rehearsal. We had been working super late into the night, and I finally was crawling back home in that cold. It was February, cold New York night. It was dark, slushy snow, and I don't even remember falling asleep. I was asleep before my head even hit the pillow. In the middle of the night, I woke up with a start. There was a phone ringing in, right outside my room in the hall. And I remember thinking, that's for me, and it's not good news. I ran out to the hall, and I picked up the phone, and they said to call home that there had been an emergency. I raced back in my room, and I called home, and a woman answered the phone. And I said, Mom, Mom, who is it? And the woman answered, Martha. It's Aunt Becky. It's your mom. No, not my mom. My brain raced through all the people it could be, all the people in my life it could be, but not her, not my mom. At the same time that I was in my dress rehearsal, my mom was leaving work. She went to an ATM and deposited a couple of checks. And when she got in her car, a man had gotten into the back seat and abducted her. We don't really know what happened for about an hour and a half, but about an hour and a half later, people noticed a struggle in the car at another ATM down the road. My mom floored the gas, crashed the car into traffic. The man ran out of the back seat. She came out of the driver's seat, grabbing her chest. She'd been stabbed, and she fell to the ground and died in the street with strangers. My mom had been murdered. There are no words to describe what that felt like. It almost felt as if the universe had packed a punch so hard in my stomach that it shot me straight out of my body. I don't remember anything. Things were blurry. But when I came back to it, it was the next morning. And my housemates decided I was going to go meet my sister and we were going to fly back to California. My housemates decided that I needed to eat. Internally, I was not so sure this was such a great idea. On the one hand, I felt starving. On the other hand, I thought I was going to vomit. But either way, I went along with it. I had a housemate on either side. I was looking at the back of my roommate's head. And we got into the cafeteria. And it was loud Saturday morning, lots of clanging dishes, people talking really loud, the sicky, sweet smell of syrup and bacon and eggs. You know what I'm talking about, right? And we got about halfway in, and everything went real quiet. And I heard this quiet whispering. And I took a few more steps. And then I realized they were whispering about me. There she goes. There's the girl whose mother was murdered. In my small liberal arts college, overnight, it had spread like wildfire. Everyone knew. My housemates got me out of there, and I remember leaning up against the cold outside wall of the cafeteria, thinking to myself, I am not going to be the girl whose mother was murdered. 
nor is my mom's extraordinary life going to be defined by how she was taken. What I didn't realize is I made a second decision. That by not talking about the trauma, by not talking about what happened, I really couldn't talk about her. I wound it up and I buried it. We got back to California, they couldn't find him. There was no fingerprints, he had vanished. All that was left in the back of my mom's crash car was a Paisley baseball cap, and on that cap was a single hair, and on that hair was a follicle that they extracted DNA from. Well, they ran that DNA through the system and there was no matches. So the investigators took all the evidence, they threw it in a drawer and slammed it shut, and that was it. Over 300 people came to my mom's memorial. They talked about all the things she had done in the community, how she had helped people, how she cared for people that nobody else seemed to care for, what an extraordinary person she was. I could not be moved. They didn't know her. They didn't know me. They didn't know that I didn't know how I was actually going to survive now that the center of my universe had been taken from me. Needless to say, I did not go back to that smaller arts college where everybody knew my story. No. I channeled my rage and my anger and became an environmental activist. I was going to save the species. I was going to be the voice for the species that nobody cared about. This eventually led me to maybe go back and get my undergraduate and my master's and my PhD, still with a conservation passion, but now I was interested in using genetic tools to address these conservation questions. I would look at the DNA of the species throughout the species range and try and figure out how different individuals were related to each other so I could better conserve and protect them. I used the DNA from the species I cared about to tell their stories. All this time through my undergrad, my master's, my PhD, my professors, my advisors, my colleagues, my lab mates, nobody knew. No one knew who she was, what had happened to me. I took all of that and tightly wound it and buried it as deep as I could. Towards the end of my PhD, I got a phone call. The investigator had actually opened up that cold case file drawer and ran the DNA, and they had a match. It was a man serving a life sentence in Texas. All of a sudden, front page of the newspaper, all in the same area where I grew up, where I got my master's and my PhD, it was in the news in the evening. All of a sudden, everybody knew Everybody knew, and it was all about how she was taken and not about her life. Cold case murder solved 17 years later. It was like I was right back in that cafeteria with the hushed whispers, the sicky sweet smell, and wanting to vomit. The trial took many months. Eventually, he confessed, and he was found guilty. But the next stage was the sentencing hearing, and the prosecution was seeking the death penalty. Well, my mom was a political activist, and she was anti-death penalty. Um, she didn't believe in it. She had worked very hard against it. And so my sister and I felt, despite other members of my family absolutely not agreeing with us, my sister and I felt that it was very important for us to go to the sentencing hearing, address the judge, and beg for mercy for this man who had killed our mother. Well, I had defended a dissertation. I kind of knew how to talk to authority. I'd had a little experience doing that in the past. I had this in the bag. I had three succinct points that I was going to make that would be just perfect that this judge would hear and this man wouldn't get the death penalty, and then I would have stood up and honored this woman that had meant so much to me. So we arrived to the courtroom. I had my three bulleted points on a piece of paper, and we opened up the door, and a wave of stale, nervous sweat smell hit me in the face. My mouth went dry, and I could hear my paper rattling from my shaking hands. 
And we walked in, and everybody was facing the judge, including the man who had killed my mom. I was looking at the back of his head, and I was looking at the judge. And people are asking me, like, what did you feel? I can't answer that question. I, I felt nothing. I felt something. I don't know. But I was looking at the man who had taken so much from me, but only the back. As I looked at him, I looked down at my piece of paper, bracing myself to make my points, defend this, defend, to speak for my mom, just like I had defended my dissertation. And when I looked down, it was blank. It was blurry. I'd had a blind panic. Here I was at the most important point in my life where I was going to actually stand up and speak for the woman whose voice had been silenced. And I had nothing. I felt my sister to my right. I looked at the judge. I looked at the back of the man's head. And then I started to talk. It took me a while to figure out what I was even saying, but it was definitely not the three points I had made. But what I did say was the story of my mom. I talked about her sense of humor. I talked about how she always believed every single human had light and good, that every person deserved a second chance, that she would have defended someone just like him. I talked about what she meant to me. I talked about how we communicated without even talking, that she was my best friend, that we called ourselves the survivors. In this process of telling the story of my mother, and my sister next went and told her story from her perspective. We talked about who she was, what she wanted, and that we, we begged the judge to, to listen to these words and listen to the voice of our mother. The judge went back into his room to deliberate. And we sat there, and I think at that point I probably did come into my body and realize the enormity of what was going on. And when he came back, he said that based on the family's words, he could not give the death penalty to this man, that he would have life without parole. So our words had made that difference. But what's more significant to me than any of that is that little piece of DNA that little chunk of DNA, the DNA that I use to conserve species, that little piece of DNA allowed me to uncoil and unravel the story of my mother. For the first time in my life, I was able to talk about this extraordinary, badass woman I was lucky enough to call my mom. Thank you. <laughs> Wow. Just wow. Can you believe that story? I still can't. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, but damn, it's such a great story. To learn more about Martha, visit our website, storyclutter.org. Our website is just one way to connect with Story Clutter, but there are so many other ways, and we hope you'll use them all. You can always follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Head to storyclutter.org to become a financial supporter. Or if you want to come to one of our shows, start your own Story Clutter show in your community, or even learn how to tell your own science story, you can learn all about that on our website too. This podcast is produced by me, Misha Gajewski, along with Nikisha Roberts-Washington, Jen Chen, and Aaron Barker, executive director and co-founder of The Story Clutter. The stories featured in today's episode were produced by Paula Croxon, Latasha Wright, Jachesh Jaggi, and Kelly Vinyl. Special thanks goes out to Story Clatter's board and staff, including Anne-Marie Lonsdale, Leslie Brentson, and Lindsay Cooper. Our theme music is by Ghost, and we'll be back next week with more wonderful stories about science and the power of really good friends. Until next time, thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.